All right, this is a review of the second half of the first episode of Netflix series Ancient Apocalypse. I'll put a link to the first video, so if you haven't seen it, you can go back and watch it. Before I start, I want to say I really appreciate everyone who took the time to watch my first video. I know it was really long and it was kind of roughly put together. This one will have a different format and hopefully that will make this video more enjoyable for people. I did get a request to make a 10-15 minute version summarizing everything, so I'll be doing that after I make this video and that'll be before I start the review of the second episode of Ancient Apocalypse. To start again, I just want to give some feedback on myself. I currently have a master's degree in archaeology and working towards my PhD. My research focuses primarily on hunter-gatherer societies in the southeastern section of North America, and I specialize in lithics and landscapes. As I mentioned, this video will be reviewing the second half of There Once Was a Flood episode of Graham Hancock's Ancient Apocalypse. I'll be showing short clips this time that focus on the claim or research methodology, and then I'll be showing an image with the argument made and, or the analysis performed. So with all of that, let's kind of jump in. So we have three methods here. The GPR. Yeah, that's ground penetrating radar. The ground penetrating radar. Yeah. yeah. And the uh, resistivity tomography. Yeah and also the seismic tomography. Previous. So there's three methods Dr. Dr. Hilman Nadawajaja is using GPR, resistance tomography, and seismic tomography. Um, GPR would be the methodology that I would be most familiar with as I use it several times, primarily in locating historic burials. Seismic and resistance tomography I understand the principles and how it works, but I've never used either personally, but I just wanted to give a bit of my background um, on the geological techniques before we jumped into the results and everything like that. And goes far deeper. So we're gonna do the ground penetration radar, the GPR surveys. Ground penetrating radar emits pulses of radio waves into the ground. When they hit something, they bounce back, and that data is recorded and analyzed. Uh, we chose the frequency of 40 minutes. So I have some questions about the application of GPR in the analysis of the site. When I've conducted GR GPR to detect burials that may have just been two meters underground, we would get a lot of interference from roots. I would like to just, we would just mark them as anomalies. I think we would need to know what particular research questions Dr. Nadawajaja is trying to, to answer with the application and to really determine if it's adequate for this purpose or not. So with that, we can kind of get into the, at least personally, the more interesting geological results that Dr. Nadawajaja um, has found. Uncovered an intriguing spot deep inside the hill. It has a seismic velocity about 200 meters per second. Right. Which in A-man's terms means what exactly? That's a void. A void, an empty space. And He goes into the resistance and uh, seismic tomography on here. For the first part, we're just going to do the seismic, uh, I'm sorry, the resistance first. So these are the results of the resistance uh, tomography. Here you can see that there's a void located near the center of the research area. Now we know, as Dr. Nadawajaja and Hancock mentioned earlier, that this research area is a volcano. I completely agree with the results of the resistance tomography that there is a void near the center of the vol volcano, which should be expected, right? It is a volcano. Volcanoes have voids in them. What is the most confusing, for me at least, is that when a geologist conducted geological research of a void in a volcano, his first assumption was that it's evidence of some type of human activity and not a possible natural occurrence. If you were to picture a volcano, wouldn't you think that there would be a void 
in there from the magma. We know that columnar joints rise in this area. Hancock also has said that himself. So I'm just really puzzled as to why this is surprising or if anyone would think that humans did it. Um, with that, we'll go into the seismic now and that opens up a, a much larger discussion. Connecting to this chamber beneath the second terrace. What Dr. Hillman and his team have discovered are at least three large rectangular chambers. One around 10 meters down, perhaps an entrance hall of some kind. It seems to have an access tunnel leading to a larger main chamber. And another passage connecting to a third chamber between 20 to 30 meters deep. All three located. Okay, so now we get into the results of the seismic uh, tomography and these three voids that they're labeling as chambers. So we can bring that up real quick and we see that there is a area that they're labeling as an artificial wall. Um, there's not a lot of reasoning for this. I, I can't find any that they're just labeling as a um, artificial wall. If you look at the poster that I'll show later, they actually have Dr. Akbar in there that we saw earlier, and they, they're labeling one of the profiles as a wall, as an artificial wall. But more importantly, we can see that there is a rectangular-like shape um, void um, in this research area. And so Dr. Nadawajaja believes that these are man-made. So if we take just a second, let's look at other volcanoes. And we can see this is an image from an article in Geochemistry, Geophysics, and Geosystems on the study of a volcano in the Caribbean. We can see that this journal specializes in geological research. So we can see that these rectangular-like shapes or voids occur naturally and have been identified as magma chambers. So once again, we have a magma chamber inside of a volcano. Dr. Nadawajaja believes that these are human-made chambers and not natural, with what I believe is no artifact or anything of identifying human activity in those areas. So I would kind of ask y'all again, if you knew that volcanoes could create rectangular-like shapes with magma chambers and central voids, and you did a geological analysis of a volcano, and those were the results that you got, and they matched other results in other volcanoes, you, would you jump to the conclusion that those chambers were man-made? Or would you do a comparison between what you're finding at the volcano that you're doing geological analysis at and other researchers who have also done research at a uh, volcano? So I personally wouldn't come to the conclusion after doing all this research that they were man-made would possibly mark them as anomalies, but I wouldn't expect anyone to think they were man-made without having more evidence for it. So until there's any kind of evidence that they're not just natural forming, then I think the best thing to do is rule them as natural because we see them in other volcanoes and we see that the process creates comes naturally, and so, and there's no artifacts that have been found. So why would you assume that they're man-made? Okay, so with that, we'll get up into the next section about, you know, the overall geology or the overall layout of this site. But to historians and the archaeologists who first excavated this site, Dr. Hillman's discovery just doesn't make sense. All right, so here we have that the geology or the layout of the site doesn't make sense. Hancock says that these results are unmistakable, implying that they're clearly the result of humans. 
So we know from geological science that the chambers and voids like this occur naturally in the volcano. So here Hancock says that these results don't make sense to historians or archaeologists. I, I don't know where he's getting that from. I haven't seen a single article from any archaeologist or historian working on the site saying that the geology of the site doesn't make sense. Now, if you watched my last video, you will remember that I said that there was a team of over 30 researchers that examined the area. That includes archaeologists, geologists, and several other scientists, including those that specialize in volcanoes. They all agreed that the geological layers below the two cultural layers, so the layers that Dr. Nada Wajaja is talking about, are the result of natural processes. So Hancock's statement of archaeologists and historians say that these discoveries just don't make sense seems to be inaccurate because they make sense. Naturally, those things occurred. And that is, is agreed upon by geologists and other specialists outside of archaeology or history. So when Hancock says that these results don't make sense, well, it's the reason that they don't make sense is because Dr. Nadawajaja is saying that they're human-made, they're made by humans and not naturally occurring, with no artifacts or anything else that would identify that they were actually human-made instead of naturally occurring. If Dr. Natawajaja could provide some type of, you know, identification that these chambers were anything but natural, then that would be a different story. But because he's just did similar geological analysis of a volcano as other geologists have done of other volcanoes, and gotten the same results, then you would have to say that almost every chamber, rectangular chamber, or void in a volcano would need to be researched because they could be human-made. Even if analysis, as we showed earlier, with this magma chambers creating into these rectangular voids, show the geological signs of it happening over thousands of years. So, in this case, it seems like Dr. Natawajaja and Hancock, Hancock would want you to believe that if you find a void inside a volcano, you should assume it is made by humans instead of occurring naturally, which would mean, you know, that would change not the whole story of archaeology or history, that would change all of geological science when it comes to volcanoes. And so that's why when his, he makes this claim here that it doesn't make sense, well, it makes sense if you look at it in a scientific view of geology. It doesn't make sense if you place humans as doing it instead of it occurring naturally. And so I feel like he's using this statement of, you know, Here's the clear evidence that there's chambers here. I'm not going to speak about how they can be created naturally through magma chambers at all and then say, archaeologists can't believe this. Well, no, I'm sure that the team of researchers that included archaeologists spoke to the geologists and experts in volcanoes and said, is this natural? And they responded with, yes. And so that's why Dr. Natawajaja's data doesn't make sense in the sense that you all of his analyses, I think, are correct. I think what's off on his analysis is just the interpretations that they were made by humans instead of naturally occurring with no artifacts, no geological structures that you can say are not formed naturally. So yeah, so that's just one of the things with this. The next we'll be going into another discussion that he has next, of, once again, about hunter-gatherers. ...dated this site. Dr. Hillman's discovery just doesn't make sense. The accepted timeline of human history 
tells us that the tribe of hunter-gatherers living atop the hill around 7,000 years ago wouldn't have been capable of building a structure of this colossal size and complexity. And yet, here it is. So we already know that archaeologists believe the site was at least partially constructed by hunter-gatherers 7,000 years ago. Dr. Akbar, at the beginning of this episode of Ancient Apocalypse, said that. I mentioned that in the last video that there is some debate about if all five terraces were built around 7,000 years ago or if Terrace 1 and 2 were built then and then later around 2,500 years ago, Terrace 3, 4, and 5 were built. And that comes in up about the distribution of pottery, which appearance archaeologists have dated in Indonesia and so the you can have your own opinions about okay well just because pottery is on some levels of the terrace and not others that doesn't mean that all of it wasn't constructed on 7,000 years ago and I think that's fair to do so when Hancock says that archaeologists are saying that it doesn't make sense but at the beginning of this very episode you had an archaeologist saying that and then I showed y'all in the last video I made that there are publications with those dates in it that saying hunter-gatherers constructed it. So what I think Hancock actually means is if we include the three chambers that geologists and other scientists have shown to be natural as being part of Gononpanong, the archaeological site, then archaeologists don't believe hunter-gatherers constructed it. But if we're being honest, they also, archaeologists, don't believe anyone constructed it. Not agriculturalists, not a ancient lost civilization. No one, because they are using the scientific research of geologists to make their interpretations of if, if those are natural or not. Remember, geologists have shown in other volcanoes that they appear naturally. The research team there that consisted of geologists and experts on volcanoes determined that they were natural. Based on all of that and the lack of any type of human association with any of these voids or chambers, archaeologists are saying that hunter-gatherers or agriculturalists or, you know, a modern civilization built those voids because there's no evidence for it. So this is once again one of those times that I think Hancock is trying to throw blame on archaeologists or get the audience to think, oh, well, there's a lot here, but archaeologists are just ignoring it. Well, no, archaeologists are looking at it and then consulting with geologists and experts in volcanoes to come to the conclusion that the three voids are likely not made by human, but natural. So if you have, you know, all of this, and it's, then why is Hancock only blaming the archaeologists? Why isn't he saying, oh, well, that team of researchers, those geologists and those experts on volcanoes, why, are, why is he not blaming them as well? Why is he putting all of the blame on archaeologists? It makes me feel like he's just trying to get the audience to also disagree with archaeologists instead of showing, here's all the data and there's a debate between geologists about what is going on, or more clearly, there's a debate between many geologists and one geologist. So he's throwing all of the blame for something on archaeologists when they're not the only ones that researched it. So with that, next we're going to go into the radiocarbon dates, and I think that's really the most telling of this entire episode about what's really going on at Gonopano, and I think y'all really enjoy that part. As expected, samples of the top two layers dated from 3,000 years ago back to around 8,000 years ago. But when they drilled to 15 meters, around 50... Okay, so here Hancock says, as expected, samples from the top two layers dated from 3,000 years ago back to 8,000 years ago. So... 
let's look at the data and see if Hancock's telling the truth. Once again, I will be sharing the entirety of Dr. Natawajaja's poster at the end of this video, so you can check all of this to make sure that it's there, everything like that. But so first, let's pull up the radiocarbon dates. So here we have. So here you can see that the layers and the corrected dates. So these are calibrated dates based on um, curves for radiocarbon dating. A quick lesson for people who may not be aware, BP stands for before present, and it's set to 1950. So on the top one, for instance, we see that it says Cal BP 520 to 640. An easy way to think about this is 520 to 640, 640 years before 1950, or you can just kind of add 70 years to the date. So the 3,000 to 8,000 years ago is only true if you ignore GP1-295 and GP1-1115. If you include those dates, then the dates actually range from 500 to 16,000 years ago. I have no idea why Hancock is not including these dates because this is data that Dr. Natawajaja produced. What I will say is that the dates of 500 to 16,000 years ago in layer two does call into question the radiocarbon dates of whatever is being dated. We can also see another problem here. In one core from the same drill, Layer part of layer three shows up to be about 7,000 years younger than layer two. Now, I'll let you decide why you think Hancock doesn't mention any of this in his descriptions of the dating for the cores, though. But I think it does call into question what is occurring with these dates. Because if you're having your upper layers dating to 10,000 years or so, before your lower that calls into question a lot of your dates, or at least it would for me if I was doing research on a site and I was having all of my dates go all over the place, that would make me think something's going on either with my dating samples or with the geology of the site. So let's see the rest of the discussion on the drilling um, dates. But when they drilled to 15 meters, around 50 feet or so, they found something completely unexpected. Those sections had been laid out around 11,600 years ago, pushing the origins of this site back to the end of the last ice age. All right, so I'm going to put up the image again real quick so everyone can see it. And this, once again, is data released by Dr. Natawajaja. Um, and like I said, I'll put up the entire poster later so everyone knows that this is from Dr. Hillman Natawajaja without having to go search for it yourself. So to quote what Hancock said, but when they drilled to 15 meters, around 50 feet or so, they found something completely unexpected. These sections have been laid out to around 6,000, I'm sorry, 11,600 years ago. This should be easy to confirm. Let's just look at the dates on the chart. I see nothing showing a date of around 11,600 years ago or BP. So why did Hancock say this? The only thing that matches the date of 11,600 years ago in his theory would be the disappearance of his advanced law civilization. I'll leave it up to you to think about why Hancock would throw out that date instead of any of the dates listed in the radiocarbon dating samples, and you tell me why you think Hancock would say that it dated to 11,600 years ago, matching his timeline for his lost advanced civilization, instead of what the actual data says. So with that, 
let's once again get back to a section about the radiocarbon dates. Of construction. Let's try and put dates on when this okay. was shaped. Layer four could be before 20,000. Could be before 20,000. Those drill cores were pulling up datable materials that dated way back as far as 24,000 years ago. So, I won't spend a lot of time on this just because I keep pulling up the same graph over and over again. But we saw that layer three, at least parts of it, date to almost 28,000 years ago. This, once again, at least for me, brings into question all of these radiocarbon dates. But with that, we'll kind of go into the next section, which is kind of an overview of all of the radiocarbon dates. Organic materials clearly associated with structural elements now deeply buried. And this convinced Danny, and I must say it convinces me, that Gunung Padang goes back to a remotely ancient origin. Okay, so once again, we will bring up the radiocarbon chart. And we'll see that all the samples were from soil. So when Hancock says clearly associated with construction, that seems to be quite a stretch to me because they're dating the soil. That doesn't seem to equate directly to construction. Now, if they had human, you know, artifacts or anything like that associated with that soil, then yeah, I can see an argument being made for it being, you know, part of construction. But when you're drilling down with these uh, core drilling, and then pulling up those cores and then dating those co the soil of those cores, where are you getting the idea that they were clearly associated with construction? We can also look at the soils as they're one of the most difficult of all the materials um, because of organic matter in soil is also natural. Um, and I'll provide a link in the descriptions of this about a discussion on radiocarbon dating soils. When archaeologists use soils for radiocarbon dating, it is in a soil associated with human activity. Once again, through the presence of artifacts or within a feature or human burial, something like that. With Dr. Natawajaja studies, he is just coring down into there with the assumption that you can even see on the chart for the radiocarbon dates, it's just with the assumption that they is a human component there. To me, this wouldn't be much different from someone going and coring 50 feet down into their backyard and then dating the organic matter from that core to be around 20,000 years ago. We have no proof that there was human activity there. So at most, what we're seeing is the dates of organic material that is in the soil. If Dr. Natawajaja had evidence for there being humans there or that there was some type of arrangement with the soil, then the radiocarbon date from the soil would at least be more believable. I think it would still be questioned because typically archaeologists don't just use radiocarbon dating for soil. Um, and once again, I'll have a uh, citation in the description where you can read about yourself, or if you need to, I'll pull it up and edit it into this video. Um, but it would still can be kind of debated, and there would need to be more proof, but it wouldn't be outright rejected like these are because they're just soil, the dates of the soil, and not dates of human activity on the site. So with that, we can kind of get into where... This is most of the data that's been discussed in this episode. And so now we can get more into Hancock's claims about archaeologists or archaeology and things like that going in. Utterly extraordinary. 
and bewildering. Hitherto archaeologists had regarded it as a long-established fact that no large-scale structures were built anywhere in Southeast Asia until around 4,000 years ago. So, I don't know what context he is trying to make this statement is because earlier in the episode, Dr. Akbar said the site um, dated to at least 7,000 years ago when he was in the second cultural layer. And in the first episode, once again, I showed you that the step pyramid kind of argument for uh, Gonon Padong has gone back since 18, I'm sorry, 1982. So the proof that archaeologists think opposite of what he is claiming archaeologists are thinking is within this episode itself. So yeah, I don't really know what else to say about it with that. So we can kind of just go on to the next claim. No longer seriously disputed by anybody, but what archeology span finds very hard to swallow and very hard to accept is that the origins of this structure could date back as much as 24,000 years. To the depths so here, Hancock's claim that archaeologists don't accept the dates for this site of 24,000 years is completely accurate. Archaeologists do not accept that date. Now, it's also correct that archaeologists, geologists, and several other scientists, once again, including those that are experts on volcanoes, don't accept the date for this site either. I'm still not sure why he's only saying 24,000 years ago, since Dr. Natawajaja's own results put Layer 2 back almost 28,000 years ago. So, I'm not sure what the reasoning is for not including the more extended timeline, because Hancock's entire argument is that people won't believe that things go further back in time than we currently know. Well, here you have your guest that you brought on having data saying that it goes back 28,000 years and you're saying 24,000 years. So that just seems kind of odd to me. But let's get into the next part of Hancock's claims against archaeologists. What the scholars seem reluctant to get to grips with is that the Ice Age was a very special time when the world was very different. Okay, so here, the statement by Hancock is that scholars can't or won't get to grips with that the world was very different during the Ice Age. This is another one of his claims that I don't know where he is getting that from. Who's questioning that? Majority of the work done on how different the uh, planet looked between now and the Ice Age were done by scholars. So who's questioning it? Who? What person is saying that it didn't look different? I. It, this is another one hard for me to kind of go into detailed research about because I don't even know who is saying that when scholars are the one that did primarily a lot of the work on the, you know, what the Ice Age looked like. So, yeah, no one's questioning it. I don't know why he's saying it. So, with that, the next claim from Hancock. I think that whoever built Gunung Padak shared our planet with the hunter-gatherers who we know were also widely present at that time. It's not such a wild idea. Even today, the technologically advanced nations of the world coexist with hunter-gatherer societies like the San in Namibia, or the Lacandon in Mexico, or the Kazakhs in Western Mongolia. 
different cultures at different levels of development. So here, Hancock's claim is that hunter-gatherers and this ancient advanced civilization shared the area of Ganapanam. To begin, Hancock is correct to say that it isn't such a wild idea that hunter-gatherers and agricultural societies live near one another, and we have several examples of it in modern time as he was showing. We, as industrial societies, do coexist with hunter-gatherers, but we have drastically altered hunter-gatherer lifestyles. So, going in more in-depth in that, industrialized societies and hunter-gatherer people exchange goods with one another, and we can just look at the examples Hancock just showed there as an example. So, if you look at the footwear, those boots are made by an industrialized society. We also see this in the archaeological record. In the St. John's River Valley, we see a foraging society that it exchanged goods with people who were practicing agriculture. So if both in modern and archaeological times, we have evidence of this exchange, why don't we have it at Ganampadam? They coexisted, but they were one of the only ones to never exchange goods or anything between a foraging and agricultural society. We can think about another example, colonialism. We see that the interactions on both sides, either you know through exchange, violence, that occur between both groups. So why would the two groups that gone on on coexist but never interact with any with each other? We see that once again that archaeologists say that the site was occupied at least seven thousand years ago, but there's no pottery in those two in the the base two. Um, terraces. But, and you would think that an agricultural society would have pottery there to sustain it, to, you know, put all their food, their seeds, and different things like that. But what we do have evidence is that there was a hunter-gatherer population there. So we have all this evidence for hunter-gatherers, none for agriculturalists, we have all of this evidence that agricultural and hunter-gatherer societies interact with each other when they're, you know, when they're coexisting or neighboring with one another. But at Ganapana, we don't have that either. So we have no examples whatsoever of an agricultural society being there at that time frame. And we have a bunch of comparisons where we see what it looks like and we don't see that at Ganapada. We know that hunter-gatherer people were there and utilizing the site and were constructing it. But all of that should be discredited, according to at least what Hancock is implying. And instead, we should see everything that, or we should believe the evidence that we don't have anything for. And I know Hancock's always using the excuse, the absence of evidence isn't evident. Well, the absence, you know, evidence is still evidence, though, and you have none of it. And that's going, the evidence we do have for everything doesn't count. It's not just that his theory, you know, he can't find any evidence for it, so he says, you know, the absence of evidence isn't evidence. Okay, but we have evidence for the refuting everything in your claim. So why are we also discrediting, you know, all the data from archaeological investigations, geological um, surveys, and things like that, and, you know, saying that those that's not evidence or that doesn't count, but the only thing that does count is that we can't find anything. That seems a little bit, I don't know, ridiculous to me. Now, yes, the absence of evidence is not evidence. But evidence is evidence. So why are people taking the side of no evidence compared to evidence? So if you have an idea or you have an or you're one of those people who are taking Hancock's side over all the scientific and archaeological evidence, please explain to me 
and I mean this genuinely, why you're taking the side where there's no evidence over the side where there's clear evidence. Next, we're going to go into the columnar joints um, constru as construction material and everything like that. So that'll be the next part. During my explorations on previous visits, I found several of its megalithic pillars extending out below the waterline, suggesting that earlier versions may have been constructed when sea levels were lower during the last ice age. Okay, so here we have that the columnar joints and they're in the sea are evidence of a lost ancient civilization. So we didn't show it in this clip, but prior to that, you saw that the columnar joints were being stacked in kind of different patterns to build up the structures. Hancock really doesn't provide a lot of information in this episode about these vertical columnar joints. What we do know, as Dr. Natawajaja and Hancock said earlier in the episode, columnar joints rise vertically from the ground naturally. So what then makes these columnar joints that he's finding in, in, in these um, explorations, these sea explorations, human-made? He doesn't tell us, so I can't really evaluate this because he just says it without providing any evidence of why he thinks so. So the next big part, and it's kind of a part that goes throughout the entirety of the rest of the Netflix series, are the flood stories. versions of the same tale. The notion that all of this is just a coincidence, just invented independently by individual cultures, doesn't make sense. All right, so here is that independent flood stories don't make sense to Hancock. This is another one Hancock doesn't really provide a lot of evidence for, but there's one more clip about something that he says that I want to play before I really get into the discussion of uh, flood stories. things are probably tales that, of stories that people pass down from generation to generation that survived this time. Yeah, the truly global cataclysmic events involving rapid rises in sea level yeah. uh, did occur and suddenly the, the worldwide tradition of a global flood stops being just a myth and starts being a memory, yes. an account of, of real... So here there is Hancock's theory that there is a global catastrophic flood event. So let's just talk about that for a second. A global event. That would mean that cultures all over the world experienced it. Now, if all of these different cultures experienced it, why does it not make sense that they would independently come up with it? Wouldn't that be what you would expect? It's a, a worldwide catastrophic flooding event. All of these cultures experienced a great flood, and because of that, they passed down the stories of the flood. So why does Hancock say that it doesn't make sense that these flood stories are the result of independent invention? For his theory, wouldn't it be better if there was a global, if there wasn't a global catastrophic flood, yet all of these cultures still had it? Because that would show that it only occurred in a small area, and that Hancock's you know, idea of an advanced law civilization. They were the ones that experienced it. And then they went out and told other cultures about it. So if it was not a global, but a localized one, and then that story got spread everywhere, then I could see the argument for it not being independent invention. But if Hancock saying, oh, well, there was a global catastrophic flooding event that completely changed the what the world looked like and flooded all of these different areas around the entire world wouldn't it make sense that those cultures who experienced it came up with a story about it i i just don't really see how a global catastrophic event results in 
a single story from one culture only being created instead of multiple cultures. Because you have to remember, according to Hancock, this global flooding cat, cat catastrophe reached parts that, you know, not just the coastlines experience. So, you know, you have these huge amount of cultures that would have experienced it. Why wouldn't they come up with their own version of it? Why wouldn't they talk about this, you know, global, I mean, this flooding event that they experienced? Now, if it was small and only one society came up with it, then yeah, then it, sh it came from there. But how do you have a global event and then say, oh, well, all the people around the globe didn't talk about it. Only one set of people talked about it. That just doesn't, you know, that doesn't make sense to me. So I'll let you have your own opinions of that. But if someone can explain to me how that would make sense, please inform me. So with that, we'll go on to um, the next part, which is another, another claim against archaeology made by uh, Hancock. But the way archaeology works, there's going to continue to be huge resistance to new evidence. And that's really problematic because science should be open to new evidence and it should be willing to change its mind when new evidence suggests that a change of mind is needed. What sort of reaction have you had from the other? I completely agree with Hancock that archaeology should be open to new evidence. And there are some archaeologists that push it back against you know, different interpretations more than others. But I feel like if the evidence is strong enough, most will be open to the new interpretation. There's been, you know, countless archaeological sites where interpretations have changed. In a later episode, Hancock talks about Poverty Point and Serpent Mound. And I know from experience that there is a lot of people who have arguments about Poverty Point, for instance, but there's four different arguments, so and people lean different ways. But if archaeology was this one mindset that would never change anything, well, then how come there's multiple interpretations for Poverty Point? Because that would go against Hancock's theory here. Now, in this specific case, it's that the data from Gunung Padong being older or being the result of a lost, ancient, advanced civilization just isn't there. The dates are all over the place, as I showed earlier. You have upper levels that are dating to older than bottom levels. You have chambers and voids which are occurring naturally in other volcanoes, yet are being we're being told that they're not naturally occurring, that they're human-made in this one. And then there's just a lack of physical items that have been left around, for either the coexistence between hunter-gatherers and this advanced civilization, or anything that was, you know, that hunter-gatherers would be using, that foraging society would be using. So, with all that, this brings us to the kind of the end of this episode and onto the next point of discussion. So, that is. what I would need to see to believe the claims from this episode. I'll go in order that they appeared in the episode. First, that the chambers and voids and solid volcanoes are being constructed by humans and not natural occurrences like at other volcanoes. So for this, I would need to see artifacts associated with these chambers or voids. When I show the poster at the end of the video, and you'll see that there is something that Dr. Nada Wajaja classifies as a stone artifact. There's two issues with the artifact. The first being that it says it was buried under 3M. I'm assuming that means 3 meters, which wouldn't place it inside of any of the chambers. The other is that I don't think it's an actual artifact. It isn't, chip stone, it isn't a chipstone tool, and it doesn't appear to be a ground stone either. If you look closely at the grounding or polishing or wear patterns on the tool. He doesn't notate what type of stone it is either. 
since I don't believe that it's an artifact, I just wanted to offer up something else that would at least make me believe that the chambers were made by people, just to be fair and be open-minded. Potassium argon dating can be used to date volcanic rock and ash. So if one of these chambers aren't natural and the dates for the chambers are voyage, they should align with the radiocarbon dates. But if you date these, you know, if you core down into these chambers and get deposits, which you can do, and you date that using potassium argon, if those dates are different from the soil or from the dates you're proposing for the, the chambers being constructed or the occupation of the site, then that should kind of just end the argument. At least if they're different, that ends the argument. If they're the same, you have a better chance of people believing that these are human-made instead of just being natural. Next would be the dating of the site. I think the first thing to do would be to figure out what's going on with the dates. Why are some parts of the upper layers dating older than the bottom layers? My guess, though, I'm not an expert, would be some type of natural volcanic activity is the reason for this. So once again, I want to make sure I keep an open mind, and so I would suggest something else. Locating organic material in a feature or a deposit that contains an artifact, and then dating that, then there's at least, you know, you have that correlation between this area was has human activity on it, or in it, or anything like that. And so then you can say, you know, if your dates go beyond 7,000, but we have the proof that it was a human activity area, and we have an older date. At that point, it would make a very strong argument because you have the physical evidence and you were already doing the dating. So I feel like that would be a really big benefit to your, um, to Dr. Nada Wajaja's theory. Also, in these large drills, the coin that they're doing, artifacts turn up in those. Like, there's been plenty of times that people have cored a site or anything like that, even with smaller cores, and come up with artifacts in the cores. So it's definitely possible that through the coring that you could find some if they were there. Um, and if I'm being honest, if you found an artifact and then found and then dated the feature that that artifact was in and it shows up to be older than 7,000 years, then I would probably be like, yeah, okay, he's right. So then the third and final claim that hunter gathers and this advanced Law civilization lived side by side with one another and interacted. I would need to see some kind of physical evidence for this. Since Hancock says that the advanced law civilization aren't foraging, I would need signs that agricultural practices were taking place around the dates that Dr. Natawajaja is using. Unlike other sites that Hancock suggests for his law civilization, this one isn't underwater and dates according to Dr. Natawajaja's data dates back to the, the last ice age. So if you believe that Dr. Natawajaja dates are correct, the signs of agriculture should be showing up near the site at that same time. Now, if that can't be found, I would need to see a site dated to around 11,600 years ago that we know that the people were foragers and have them have something from the advanced ancient law civilization with them, you know, from exchange. Since Hancock believes Gunnapon were agriculturalists, they would need at least some type of storage vessels for surplus food, because that's one of the, you know, the big things with the adoption of agriculture and its, you know, continued use. So if we found pottery at the site that dates back beyond 7,000 years, Preferably 11,600 since that's the dates that Hancock always gives, but I'd be open to over 7,000 years, which you can date pottery um, from when it was fired. So I think that would be really good evidence. So those are the things that I would need to see to believe the claims that are made in this episode. What would you need to see or why do you believe the evidence is enough or is not enough to, you know, prove the claims or disprove the claims and stuff like that. As promised, I did say I would show the poster, and here it is. This is uh, an image of Dr. Nada with Jaws. I'll have it also cited in the description if you want to go and look at it yourself, because I know this may not be the most best clarity. And 
as I mentioned before, I'll be doing a 10 to 15 minute shortened review of the first episode next. This will just be hitting the high points, but I really wanted to make sure I had these longer videos so that if anyone has any questions or thinks I didn't cover, you know, X or Y, they could come and watch these longer videos. I think I may even do a 10 to 20 minute video discussing archeological sites in the future, primarily Eastern Woodlands since that's where all my research focus is. And I think there's a lot of cool sites people aren't really familiar with. Possibly even discussions on some of the work tribes are doing reclaiming their history or talks about some of their stories and cultural practices. Um, I may even talk about some of my own research and the data that I presented on, you know, at certain conferences and things like that. I may also do a video, and I think this is a really big issue in, you know, the understandings of when archaeologists or something label people as hunter-gatherers or agriculturalists or anything like that, kind of going over what the real differences are and examples of all of them so that people have a better idea when they're coming into, you know, these arguments that hunter-gatherers couldn't have done this or archaeologists would let you believe that hunter-gatherers were did this or, you know, with the adoption of agriculture, all of this got better and things like that. So I think I'll maybe do a video describing all of that. I'm really excited. I've been really enjoying this. I hope everyone that's watching is enjoying it. But anyway, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate everybody coming and watching these videos. I'll put up updates on when I'm going to be releasing the shorter review in case, you know, you have someone that, you know, may not want to watch a hour and two hour long discussion of one episode. And maybe you can just send them like a, you know, 10 to 15 minute review of everything. So thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Y'all have a good one.